Right, so welcome everyone to the uh, Himalayan webinar series, uh, module number four. We'll be talking about uh, food and shelters today, which will be kind of complementary to yesterday's session where we discovered, discussed the uh, gears, hiking gears required to traverse the different Himalayan terrains discussed in module two and safeguard yourself against the uh, high altitude weather. Uh, we still have a couple more interesting sessions lined up uh, in the next couple of modules on alpine style independent hiking maps and navigation to find your own way in the wild. Uh, my favorite topic will be uh, number seven, minimalism and fast hiking, followed by a few uh, tips on exploration of uh, unknown areas and route planning in the Himalayas. From chapter 9 to 15, we'll be uh, zooming in on the various types of uh, regions in the Western Himalayas, uh, sharing some of the experiences and the beautiful places discovered in those sites. Okay, small uh, reminder that as of today, we are going live every day at 8 o'clock. You can join via mobile or desktop at the uh, tiny URL slash HimaWeb. Uh, Sessions are recorded and posted on my Instagram account, first 10 minutes. Uh, the full archive is available on the blog, ultrajourneys.org. Uh, requesting to mute, mute yourself during the session, we can have a small Q&A uh, at the end of uh, every session. All right, let's get started. Uh, food and shelters. So today we'll be discussing uh, about uh, following topics uh, about water and hydration food how you how you plan your food during your exploration journeys in the high passes uh, how do you manage cooking what about hospitality shelters camping and then again uh, q a let's start with the most important thing water or hydration as a hiker uh, you burn a lot of calories hiking in the high passes with steep uh, elevation gain uh, burn, I mean, uh, will drain a lot of uh, water from the body, even though you might not realize it uh, due to the uh, comfortable climate at higher altitudes. But it's very important to stay hydrated, uh, especially more so because uh, taking sufficient water will also help you in, during the initial uh, week of uh, acclimatization at higher altitudes. Unfortunately, uh, boats like in the Himalayas, again, most, mostly on the touristic uh, sites, like say Marka Valley or even in the Sahyadris, uh, when I hiked uh, 200 forts in November and December, I saw a lot of boat tourists as well as local people uh, drinking bottled water, which is uh, very sad. Uh, during my internal journeys, I will never touch a bottle of water, I always depend on natural water sources. You got streams, you got uh, melting snow and glaciers, uh, which will give you sufficient water sources actually uh, that you don't even have to carry water with you. As long as you hydrate yourself whenever you uh, come across a water source, mostly you'll be uh, fine. I see a lot of Europeans, especially in Ladakh, uh, carrying water filters with them, which again, I don't think is really required as in the water at uh, these high altitude sources. If there are no villages, of course, uh, on top of you are pretty much pristine. How do you plan your waters? Water is hydration is very important, but at the same side, uh, time is of course very heavy. Uh, I see a lot of hikers carrying two, three, liters equals kilograms of water uh, and then basically uh, carrying that water all the way till the next stream which is basically meaningless uh, the rule is always whenever you have a, a clear water body near you like a running uh, crystal clear water stream you drink from them you hydrate yourself pretty well you drink sufficient water to fill up the stomach and then basically you keep always planning or estimating how much time will it uh, be required to hit the next water source. To do that planning, obviously, you need to be aware uh, of the topography of the land landscape around you, where the, uh, the next stream will be located, where are the side valleys. Uh, for this, of course, it's uh, important to, uh, to have a map, topographic map with you, with you which we'll be discussing in the, uh, one of the upcoming chapters maps, uh, map reading and navigation. 
Uh, one point on main versus side streams. Main streams in the main valleys, especially as you come down from the passes to lower altitudes, uh, the water will pick up force, especially in the late afternoon or uh, peak summer when there is uh, peak melt water of uh, the glaciers and the snow. And the force of the water typically tends to drag along a lot of uh, soil, so the water becomes muddy. So my kind of uh, plan will always be uh, to hydrate myself from the side streams rather than the mainstream. Water presence, of course, highly depends on the season. Are we at the beginning of uh, spring, where a lot of the water will still be frozen, snow and glaciers? Or are we somewhere uh, in peak summer, where there will be a lot of melt water? Water planning again becomes very important as you cross passes, as you go up to these higher altitudes, uh, crossing over the ranges, the amount of water there will be less than in the valleys, obviously, down in the, say, below two, 3,000 meters in the alpine meadows and the uh, forests. So as you plan those high altitude pass crossings, you'll always have to make sure that you have sufficient water uh, along with you, uh, depending on the number of hours or days even it will uh, take you to cross a certain pass and get back down to a lower altitude where you will find water again. Same with campsites, uh, only suitable campsites in addition to finding flat space where you can pitch up will be the presence of water obviously. One other interesting thing is that water doesn't have to be running always even when you walk in the snow with no running water around you. You can easily melt some snow by putting it in a bottle uh, empty bottle and shaking it uh, ferociously to melt the snow, yeah, even if you don't have cooking gears with you. Food planning. So here again, you can um, use the use the bulk approach of uh, what I see uh, most expeditions doing, say in Ladakh. Uh, they basically carry uh, three day three weeks of food with them, loading like uh, five horses with. Uh, 50 kilogram per horse, mainly food items in addition to shelters and stuff, but basically carrying heavy loads of foods over an extended period of time, which I think is pretty meaningless, given the fact that at least every couple of days you will be coming across some settlement, some small village, uh, some even mountain tribe or Gujar, where you can easily resupply your food. So food planning for me will always be uh, about understanding how far uh, it is not in terms of distance but in terms of days in terms of time to reach the next settlement where again you can resupply your food and only carry the required amount of food to make it to the uh, next village so food planning basically is all about route estimation so here you can see like the first 20 passes which i crossed in uh, the summer of 2018 for every pass basically i uh, a couple of critical parameters are mentioned. So as this last village in the current valley uh, and the first village that I reached uh, after crossing the pass in the destination valley. Uh, altitude of the pass is important as well as the starting and uh, finishing altitudes of the from and to village, which will give you the total ascent and the total descent, uh, more than the distance. From the last village to the first village, it's the climbing that will uh, uh, require a lot of effort, burn a lot of calories, and uh, take its time. And then basically the main uh, data, the main property for every pass will be the number of days required uh, to go from one village to the next village crossing the pass. So based on this uh, number of days, I will carry uh, the required number of food with me uh, typically two, three meals per day, uh, complemented with some snacks. A few words on fresh foods. So whenever you get the opportunity, either with shepherds, uh, Gujar mountain tribes, or small settlements, villages, uh, uh, it's always good to have fresh, freshly prepared homemade foods, uh, as you'll burn a lot of calories, obviously, uh, climbing those steep uh, mountains in the Himalayas. Uh, so nutrition and energy, uh, it's very important basically uh, when you burn like five to eight thousand calories every day, uh, even more when you fast hike the Himalayas. So, fresh food basically allows you uh, to regain the energy lost of the day and to keep you also going uh, over longer uh, durations if you plan uh, multi week or multi month journeys.
Whenever you go through villages, uh, as I mentioned, you uh, basically uh, resupply your uh, food that you're gonna make back up for the next two, three, four, five, six days until you hit the next village. And you, obviously you will also uh, make up for the lost calories in the previous section. Many of the foods uh, in the village uh, are, uh, you can actually pack up for the first uh, one or two days. Uh, if a pass crossing, in my case, again, as a fast hiker, a pass will never take 90% of the time, never take more than one or two days. So you can actually pack up any of the food here, like chapatis, parotas, uh, chow mein, uh, momos along with you in the high altitudes. Uh, climate, uh, food typically stays good for 24 to uh, 36 hours, so nothing more, nothing easier than to pack up food in the last village until again you uh, can have a hot meal in the next village that you will touch uh, after crossing the pass. Uh, this fresh food uh, packed up for one or two days is then complemented with uh, a lot of, uh, maybe that's a personal thing of me, but I tend to carry a lot of chocolates and especially peanuts to basically uh, make up for the lost sugar and salts as I fast hike through the passes. As we go up beyond the second day, uh, on day three and beyond, three, four, five, six, I typically start cooking as packed foods obviously will not stay good uh, on, uh, for longer days. So for cooked food again, instead of using uh, things like Maggi, which of course is lightweight and easy to prepare, I suggest you go for something more nutritious like uh, my typical favorite here shown as white oats. White oats is pretty lightweight, easy to make. You uh, just take 100 grams of white oats, uh, cook it uh, with some water for two minutes, and you will have something very nutritious, a lot of energy to keep uh, on going. I typically cook only twice a day to optimize the time, morning and evening. And during the day, I mostly rely again on uh, some fruits or peanuts or chocolates I carry along with me. How do you cook? You can either uh, carry a uh, canister with you with fuel, which will again increase the weight, easily one to one and a half kilogram. Or you can simply use naturally available fuel sources like in the lower Himalayas, like Uttarakhand County Mashal, as long as you're not above the forest line, above 2,500 to 3,000 meters, you'll be in the forest and you can have a lot of firewood uh, available. This, of course, is only recommended when you're solo or with a few people, not, of course, when you're gonna cook and burn a lot of wood for a big group of 40, 50 people. And even when you're actually going in the higher uh, altitudes, like say about 4,000 meters in Zanskar, Lahol, and Ladakh, you don't have vegetation anymore, you don't have firewood. But there it's all a matter of uh, collecting, say two kilometers before you settle down on the campsite, collecting dry dung from either yaks or cattle or horses used by hikers and uh, sprinkling this with a little bit of kerosene to uh, make a well-sustainable fire to cook. In addition to whatever you carry along with you, you'll also find fruits in the wild, um, in, uh, especially mid-August till September. It's the apple season in especially the districts of Kulu and Kinor. So carrying uh, five, six apples with you in your backpack will give you so much of energy that you will not eat whatever other food you're carrying. You'll find wild strawberries um, uh, near the forest line, and then even in the high altitude deserts of uh, Zanskar here, in some places I was able to find these small apricots. So again, uh, good sources of uh, fresh, natural, uh, nutritious foods. In addition to that, again, you can also look at the wilds uh, with a little bit of uh, understanding the knowledge of the local people. You will quickly get to understand which uh, are the edible plants uh, available both in like alpine, um, alpine meadows at lower altitudes, as well as here, this, the second uh, plant shown. Uh, which is available even in the high altitude uh, deserts of Zanskar and Ladakh and provides both uh, hydration and uh, nutrition. Mushrooms, of course, you need to be careful. You need to understand very well which are the edible ones versus the non-edible ones. In addition to all that uh, uh, options, uh, having your own food, uh, finding uh, stuff in the wild, you will always have the fallback option 
of uh, the mountain tribes as well as the uh, shepherds in the remotest corners and the higher altitudes of the Himalayas. Out of my experience, again, this summer, uh, spending four months uh, covering 120 high altitude passes, I would easily say that 50% uh, of the time, 50% of the crossings, I come across uh, hospitality on my route, where again, as soon as people will see you, especially again as solo and smaller groups, they will welcome you with open arms to uh, treat you on some fresh goat milk tea or some uh, freshly made rotis over the campfire uh, as you stay with them. I have a small video here on food and cooking, which I took on my 19th pass this summer. So uh, I suggest you look at this offline as it's a li little bit longer, but also actually gives a nice overview on how to manage food on your uh, trans Himalayan journeys. Talking about shelters, the second part of this presentation. So as you uh, plan these uh, pass crossings, try to go from deeper and lower altitudes in the valleys uh, from the villages you go to the forest to the forest where you will meet the Gujar, the mountain tribes then again you go higher to the alpine meadows where you'll find the shepherds grazing their herds uh, you'll also find uh, shelters both open and closed shelters then again beyond that you'll come into the no vegetation zone of rock and ice crossing the passes sometimes snow covered and then again, going through the same sequence as you lose altitude on the other side of the pass. So keep in mind that, of course, none of these options will be available on all the passes. But again, uh, if you talk about the routes like ancient uh, uh, migration routes used by shepherds or ancient traders uh, in some of the valleys between Uttarakhand and Tibet, or uh, some of the uh, passes crossed by villages, you will definitely come across Gujar settlement shepherds and uh, numerous shelters, which will be ideal campsites for you to spend the night. So in the villages again, uh, especially the last villages in the valleys, deep inside, away from uh, civilization and money-minded uh, cities, you will come across very friendly villages which will uh, be, uh, in many cases, very hospitable, offering you food and shelters. Beyond those lost villages, beyond the, the lost roadheads, beyond electricity and beyond mobile networks, in, inside the forest, you will find the Gujars staying in very primitive shelters, uh, along with their uh, cattle. People are, again, extremely friendly and uh, <coughs> will not let uh, any opportunity pass by, especially in the less touristic places, to invite you into their home uh, in case uh, <coughs> you settle down at the end of the day near one of these settlements. Going beyond the Gujar, then, in the higher altitudes, you come across the shepherds, which will uh, either be staying in open shelters, as shown on the right here in the Linky Valley of La Hole. Uh, they have these homemade blankets and clothes, woolen uh, blankets, which will keep them warm or in pretty high altitude, cold climate, they will also have these rock igloos, closed shelters in which they stay. So these places are also suitable uh, places to spend the nights as, uh, again, you have shelters, you are pretty safe from nocturnal predators, and uh, they protect you from the cold and possible rain in the night. If you don't meet anybody along the way, you'll still find uh, shelters which are either used, uh, temporary shelters used either by shepherds as they migrate across the passes or used by uh, some of the villagers or the hikers along these routes. So again, a shelter is always preferred to camping as it provides better protection against cold wind in the nights, against rain, obviously, to keep yourself dry, and also an element of safety that you're not exposed in the open and more vulnerable to predators roaming in the high ranges. If uh, you don't find any of the above, uh, then you will fall back to uh, camping uh, using your own uh, the gears, the shelter you carry along with you. So one thing I want to make very clear here is that rule number one is always to uh, camp outside the wind. You find some place, uh, some tree, some bushes, some rocks, some overhanging boulder or some shelter basically where you cut the wind, the wind, uh, especially the cold night wind at high altitudes, is the one that is gonna drain your body heat the whole 
uh, night and possibly cause hyperthermia, which can be life-threatening. So it's very important that uh, instead of pitching up a tent in the middle of an open meadow, exposed to the wind the whole night, uh, it's completely meaningless. Uh, it's a complete waste of carrying three, four kilograms of tent material with you, pitching it up in the open with uh, obviously no other use than cutting the wind. So instead of that, it's better to hike more lightweight, more comfortable with less weight and uh, find an intelligent uh, wind covered spot. Camping again, uh, out of my experience, 120 campsites this summer, uh, I will never use a tent or even uh, my BV light with BV, which protects me from the weather elements uh, for 90% of the time. As long as you get the wind, a sleeping mat and a sleeping bag or a quilt uh, will be sufficient. So here you see a campsite at 4,900 meters just before crossing the Kangla Glacier on the way from La Hole to Zanskar. Pretty cold nights, but again, as you cut the winds and have a proper, of course, uh, sleeping mat uh, protecting you from the cold underground, as well as the most important thing I would say is a quilt or a sleeping bag, uh, which is suitable for uh, zero degree temperatures. You, know, you don't really need to pitch up any tent. The quilt you see here is basically uh, a sleeping bag, which is open at the base. Uh, the isolated materials uh, that are used uh, to make sleeping bags only will uh, maintain their thermal properties if they are not compressed. So a sleeping bag on which you actually sleep on top uh, is meaningless again at the base of you because uh, the part of the sleeping bag on which you sleep will be compressed and will not have any thermal properties. So a quilt actually optimizes the weight further by uh, just covering you at the top and the sides and of course the feet and keeping the bottom part open which uh, where you can directly sleep on the mat. Uh, this quilt uh, has been an amazing uh, experience for me on 120 high uh, altitude campsites. Uh, quilt was gifted by me by a nice friend from Manali Huzefa who runs a small company Bluebolt.in. Uh, Huzefa is an expert on uh, thermal materials and uh, has uh, basically uh, asked me to basically uh, evaluate his uh, quilt in so many different weather conditions over those four months uh, last summer and it was a very positive experience. So if you're looking for some good materials, uh, you can consider uh, going to his website and checking out the available uh, options for you. If uh, you don't find a shelter, I mean, to cut the wind, then you will have to sleep in the open. Or again, if you don't find uh, a covered cave or a covered boulder that protects you from possible rains that night, then of course you will have to put up a tent. Or again, in my case, I prefer a 500 gram BV, super lightweight, which will also protect me uh, extremely well against the uh, cold night, even the rains. Uh, I've slept in this configuration here, uh, shown in the slide. In the rain, ice cold rains at the uh, advanced base camp of Sokangri, the highest uh, peak in that range, at around 4,900 meters. This is pretty cold at night, but again, as you layer up intelligently with a proper sleeping mat below you, you uh, get into your puff jacket or your fleece, preferably a hoodie that protects uh, the body heat from leaving the, the head. Uh, snuggled in your sleeping bag or quilt and again layered up with your BV, then uh, you'll be pretty warm uh, no matter where you end up. Uh, the configuration shown here is uh, much lighter than any sleeping bag and bulky sleeping bag combination. Uh, you have a 500 gram BV, a 600 gram quilt, a 250 gram hoodie and a 200 gram mat which is hardly uh, 1.3 kilograms uh, compared to a 4-5 usual tent and sleeping bag uh, shelter configuration. Another nice video shot here in a cave uh, during my summer expedition um, below the Margu Pass where I got stuck somewhere in the rain. Uh, I suggest you look at this video offline. I'll be sharing the slides on my website ultrajourneys.org. Uh, explains nicely on the uh, various types of gears uh, to put up a proper shelter. Voila, that's it. Uh, another short 15-20 minutes session on uh, food and uh, food and shelter. So um, thanks for joining. If you have any questions, you can drop it now in the group chat.
hope it was useful and hope to see you guys again uh, to, tomorrow for the next session. I'll keep the 